This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Uh, uh, followed by a septicemic phase, uh, resulting in systemic disease. Uh, this infection can cause mortality up to 20% in the poultry flocks, depending upon the pathogenic potential of the strain. Uh, this disease is ubiquitous in its distribution and it can infect uh, all type of commercial poultry and wild birds of any age group. The etiological agent of this disease is avian pathogenic E. coli, commonly known as APEC. Uh, treatment mainly relies on the use of uh, antibiotic therapy, but due to the overuse of these antibiotics, there is increase in number of multidrug resistant organisms, uh, so treatment may be unsuccessful. And importantly, the use of antibiotics in intensive poultry farming also poses a serious risk of uh, transmission of antibiotic resistance genes to the other bacteria. Uh, so, antibiotics is not an appropriate option. Uh, so, there are two main ways to control this infection. Uh, one is good biosecurity practices and other is vaccination. Uh, so, some uh, details about the pathogenesis of this disease. Uh, the root of infection for APEC is respiratory or vaginal, but the most uh, studied form of this disease is uh, respiratory form. So, I will be mainly focus uh, on that in this presentation. Um, upon the inhalation of the contaminated, contaminated aerosol particles, the bacteria interact with the brachial mucosa. So if there is any preliminary conditions uh, like any uh, viral or mycoplasma infection or increased level of ammonia in the shed, so this factor can damage the tracheal uh, uh, mucosa and helps the bacteria in better colonization. After that, bacteria enter into the lungs, and in the lungs, the macrophages and the epithelial cells, they are the first line of defense against the uh, APEC infection. Later, these uh, bacteria invade deep into the mucosa and submucosa and enter into the uh, bloodstream, and this disease becomes systemic. So the birds that survive this systemic phase, uh, they uh, develop these uh, classical signs of avian colibacillosis. So here you can see that there is a fibrin covering the surface of the heart. So this condition is called as pericarditis. Uh, in liver, it's perihepatitis. And in uh, air sacs also, there's an accumulation of the uh, fluid that is called as air saculitis. So these lesions they are usually uh, scored between uh, 0 to 4, depending upon their uh, severity. So we have also used this uh, scoring uh, system in our bird experiment, uh, which I will be discussing in more detail in the coming slides. Uh, some uh, details about the uh, etiological agent. So as I told you that APEC uh, is a causative agent of this disease. So they are gram-negative, rod-shaped, non-spore-forming bacteria, which can grow both aerobically and anaerobically. Actually, APEC is a subtype of uh, extra-intestinal pathogenic uh, E. coli, also known as XPEC. So there are certain other aspects uh, like uropathogenic E. coli, neonatal meningitis E. coli, and sepsis-associated E. coli uh, that cause disease in humans. So uh, because APEC is associated with other aspects that cause disease in humans, so uh, it is also a potential zoonotic pathogen. Uh, when we look at APEC, uh, there is high diversity in their uh, phylogroups and serogroups, uh, but there are few serogroups like O1, O2, and O78 that are more predominantly associated with this disease. And other characteristic feature of this uh, APEC is the carriage of large virulence plasmids. So these plasmids, they uh, usually encode for imp uh, some important virulence genes uh, that are highly uh, conserved among the APEC strain. So uh, this is a schematic map of the APEC plasmid. So it's a big plasmid uh, uh, which carries a, uh, different genes. But the most important genes that are highly conserved among them are these five genes. Uh, so among them, IRON and IUTA, they are basically uh, CD4 receptors. Uh, and they are uh, very important from my research point of view. And I will be uh, discussing them in more detail in next slides. Uh, but uh, uh, these genes, uh, they are used as a diagnostic marker for uh, APEC because uh, uh, we usually use them to differentiate them from other uh, fecal commensal E. coli. Uh, now, what I have been tried before, uh, researchers, they have used different approaches in, uh, in an attempt to induce effective immunity against this disease. 
the initial efforts they were made by using some killed vaccines or inactivated vaccines and uh, later on some subunit and recombinant vaccines they have been tried uh, mostly against the uh, proteins that are expressed on the bacterial surface and the third strategy is to use the live attenuated uh, uh, vaccines by knocking out one or more genes of the bacteria uh, and that is important in its uh, metabolism so the common trait for all of these strategies is that they do not provide protection against the heterologous challenge However, there is just one uh, product that have been reached to the level of commercial success. Uh, that is an ROA mutant, and it is uh, marketed by uh, Zoetis as Polvec E. coli. So uh, before I go into the uh, details of this vaccine, I uh, just want to briefly explain the function of ROA gene. Uh, so ROA gene is uh, important uh, for the synthesis of some aromatic amino acid. So there is a long metabolic chain uh, uh, that is uh, responsible for the synthesis of these aromatic amino acid. And ROA in is present at its last step. It encodes for an enzyme 5 in all pyruvate uh, shikimate 3 phosphatase uh, that is responsible for conversion of shikimic acid to charismic acid. And charismate uh, is an intermediate product for these uh, amino acid and uh, two other chemical compounds, PABA and uh, uh, DHP. Uh, so uh, these PABA and DHP, they are uh, not uh, uh, produced by the vertebrate host. And so in the absence of this uh, ROA gene, the bacteria will become exotrophic for these uh, amino acids and uh, they cannot colonize their host well and uh, can't cause a severe disease. So that's why uh, these vaccines, they are considered as a, a safe uh, uh, live attenuated vaccines for uh, even colibacillosis. Uh, now, um, various cross-protection studies, they have been uh, carried out using this uh, Polvec E. coli. Uh, so uh, the result of these studies have shown that uh, this vaccine is effective in reducing the burden uh, of the disease against the homologous challenge, that is the, the zero against the zero group O78, uh, but it failed to provide any uh, significant protection against the other heterologous uh, zero groups, which include uh, O125 and uh, O1. Uh, so this zero group specific protection suggested that this uh, possible role of O antigen in inducing the immune response against these vaccines, so which limits uh, their potential to offer cross protection against uh, diverse APEC zero groups. Uh, so as I told you that there are multiple strains of APEC that are involved in the outbreak. So the development of more promising vaccines with broader, broader spectrum of protection against APEC is needed. So here comes our strategy. Um, we decided to mutagenize two genes. Uh, so first gene is the OBD gene, and it is involved in the import of peptide into the bacterial cell. Uh, uh, OBD gene, uh, mycoplasma galliseptinum gene deletion mutant, they have been tested before, and they were found to be safe and uh, protective. But the effect of such mutation on the uh, virulence of APEC is not known. So uh, instead of just uh, checking its effect individually, we decided to combine its effect with an other gene uh, so that we can make a double mutant. Uh, so our first target gene uh, for this project is the OBG, OBD gene. The second target gene is Ton B. Ton B is basically involved in the transport of uh, iron into the bacterial cell. Uh, iron is an important element that is required for many metabolic and cell signaling pathways. Uh, but the availability of iron for the bacteria is low because it is mostly bound with the uh, host proteins or is present in its ferric state in which it is insoluble. Uh, therefore, to overcome this iron limiting condition, bacteria produce certain chemical compounds known as thidrophores. So they have a high affinity to bind with iron. Most of the E. coli, they produce a uh, thidrophore known as enterobactin. Uh, but the, uh, this uh, enterobactin will become ineffective during the infection because it is evaded by the host immune responses. Uh, so the pathogenic bacteria, which also include APEC, they have two additional thidrophore systems that include salmokin and aerobactin. Uh, Selmokilin is basically a modified form of uh, enterobactin that can evade, evade the host immune uh, responses. Uh, so once um, the cidrophore they are produced, they bind with iron and form a ferry cidrophore uh, complex. And transport of this ferry cidrophore complex across the outer membrane requires energy uh, that is driven by this Ton B gene. Uh, so 
in this way, the tone B is important uh, for iron import uh, for the bacterial cell. So when the uh, concentration of the intracellular iron is high, uh, so there is a negative loop mechanism which derepress the synthesis of these uh, CD4 receptors on the bacterial surface. So in this way, uh, tone B and uh, this negative loop system, they can cause the iron homeostasis. Now, what will happen uh, when we delete this tone B gene? So in the absence of this tone B gene, the intracellular iron concentration uh, will be low. So this will uh, de-repress this uh, negative loop system and result in the uh, uh, increased uh, production of these CD4 receptors on the bacterial surface. But these CD4 receptors, they are non-functional uh, in the uh, absence of tone B gene. So basically, basically these CD4 receptors, they are IRON and IUTA genes that I uh, told you in the uh, start of my presentation. Uh, so, and these receptors, they are highly conserved and widely distributed uh, in the apex strain, irrespective of their zero group. Therefore, it is likely that they will confer a serotype independent uh, protection. Uh, for all these reasons, we think that uh, TRON-B is a promising target for mutagenesis and its uh, deletion is expected to attenuate apex virulence and will confer a serotype independent protection. Some previous studies, they have been uh, carried out in our group using this tone B gene deletion mutant. So this mutant was basically uh, made in an APEC E956 strain. APEC E956 is an old isolate, uh, which was recovered from a healthy uh, uh, broiler breeder bird. Uh, this strain uh, E956 un was non-typable. And uh, the it's, uh, Dawn B gene was replaced with an antibiotic resistance uh, cassette. So for all these reasons, this construct is not amenable directly uh, for developing a commercial live vaccines. Uh, however, the results of this uh, study uh, suggested that Tone B gene a mutant is uh, safe because it resulted a significantly less liens in the air sex, heart, and liver uh, as compared to the wild type uh, challenge strain. Uh, this mutant was also uh, used uh, uh, to protect the birds against the homologous challenge, and it was found to be effective because uh, it uh, resulted in a less number of lesions and less re-isolation uh, rates in uh, vaccinated challenged group as compared to the unvaccinated uh, challenge group. So both, so both of these uh, two studies, they provide the proof of the concept that apex uh, torn B mutant, they are potential uh, vaccine candidates. Now, uh, my goal of this project is to make a serotype independent vaccine. So we uh, shortlisted these two genes, one gene from the oligotransport system, OBD, and other is from the iron uptake system, TONB. So uh, we made double gene deletion mutant so that we can mitigate any chances of reversion of uh, virulence and we can ensure the vaccine safety. Uh, secondly, we shortlisted two distantly re related apex strain for mutagenesis so that we can uh, cross uh, serotype, so we can check their cross serotype protection potential. So idea is that if, if we immunize the bird with uh, uh, with the vaccine of the one zero group, uh, then we, it can uh, then these bird they will be uh, challenged with the uh, other zero group and vice versa. Uh, and also we have made an third uh, uh, gene deletion mutant that is arrow A so uh, so that we can compare the two attenuation strategies uh, within a consistent set of genetic background so in total we made uh, four mutants uh, in two strains so here comes the first aim of my phd project that is development of markerless don B obd double gene deletion mutant and arrow A uh, single mutant and their in vitro characterization so uh, we started with 10 apex strains that were uh, collected during 2009 to 2019 uh, by our microbiology lab. So first we screened them for the presence of any antibiotic resistance gene. Uh, three isolates, they were found to be resistant, so they were excluded from the study. Uh, then we were left with seven isolate, and uh, we for these seven isolate, first we uh, carried out the multiplex PCR. So for these five genes that are considered as a, a diagnostic marker for apex pathology, Type. So all of these uh, seven, they were found positive. And then we determined their phylo groups uh, on the basis of uh, Claremont method of phylotyping. And then we arbitrarily selected two strains. Uh, first is APEC 10578. 
and other is APEC 102026. Uh, so the phylo group for the first strain is A, that is relatively less common among APEC, whereas the phylo group of the second uh, strain is F, that is uh, predominantly present among the APEC strain. After that, we also uh, carried out whole genome sequencing of this APEC isolate, and uh, we have found that uh, that uh, all of both of these uh, strains they vary from each other at the level of their multi-locus sequence type, their serotype, and phylotype. So uh, both of these uh, strains they are, are completely different uh, in these three categories, and rest of their characteristics they look uh, but what we expect for an E. coli. Okay, then we place this isolate on top of phylogenetic tree. Both belongs to different clade. APEC uh, 102026 falls in clade cluster 1, whereas the other uh, falls in cluster 2b. So this further confirms that the two lineages which we have selected, they are sufficiently divergent uh, from each other so that we can uh, check their homologous and heterologous uh, protection potential. Okay, so we use this classical technique of lambda red homologous uh, recombination for making these mutants. Uh, I will not go into the detail of this technique, but uh, just briefly, uh, first we uh, use this gene disruption cassette. Uh, so at the both end of this gene disruption cassette, uh, there is the upstream and downstream uh, region of the target gene. So in the first step, we, repla uh, we replace the target gene with this uh, cassette. So the resultant uh, recombinant uh, uh, is a um, uh, carries the uh, antibiotic resistant gene. So these colonies they are uh, selectable in the uh, presence of that antibiotic. So th in the second round of uh, recombination, we remove this uh, gene disruption cassette from the APEC genome uh, with the help of a recombinase enzyme, leaving this just one FRT uh, site as a scar. Uh, so so uh, using this strategy, we uh, deleted all the three genes uh, from the APEC chromosome. Now we confirm uh, the results of our mutagenesis with the help of PCR. Uh, we use three sets of primers. Uh, so these two sets, they were binding in the uh, flanking region of the TONT gene, and the third primary is binding in the antibiotic uh, resistance case. Uh, so the regions of the genome, they produces the MTCONS uh, sizes that we are expecting. So for the markerless mutant from which both the antibiotic gene and the uh, target gene, they have been deleted, they, they produce a smaller band, but there is a higher band for the, with the, uh, for the mutant with marker, and a relatively smaller band uh, with the wild type APEC because the size of the uh, uh, target gene is a little bit smaller than the uh, antibiotic resistance uh, case. So a similar uh, finding with the second set of primer and with the third uh, set of primer, we just got the amplification for the mutant with marker because this is the only strain that carries the antibiotic resistance gene. Uh, so similar strategy is used for the other two gene deletion mutant, and we have also confirmed our neurogenesis uh, with the help of Sanger sequencing. Uh, now, after making this uh, mutant, the next step is their in vitro characterization so that we can determine uh, the change in a phenotype of this mutant compared to their uh, wild type. So first in vitro test was carried out uh, for Torn B mutant uh, using the chrome azarol assay. Uh, basically, uh, chrome azarol assay uh, detects the uh, level of sidrophores in the media. Uh, so whenever sidrophores are produced, there is a change in color of the uh, media from blue to orange or yellow. So you can see in this plate that there is a large orange halos around the colonies of the mutants. Uh, and uh, in comparison uh, with the wild type, uh, they, they produce a, a small halos. So the reason is that because uh, these mutants, they lack the uh, functional torn B gene. So their subsequent uh, ferric sidrophore transport was hampered. So these mutants, they are uh, producing more uh, sidrophores in futile effort to acquire iron. Uh, so if we uh, put the size of these diameters on this graph, uh, we can clearly see that uh, the size of the mutants, uh, the uh, size of the diameter of the halos for the mutant is uh, significantly bigger than the uh, size of the wild type strain. Okay, so second in vitro test is again for these torn B mutants. We grow them in different uh, 
iron replete and iron deplete conditions. Uh, firstly, iron uh, deplete conditions were made by adding DP drill. Uh, DP drill is basically an iron uh, chelating uh, agent that removes all the traces of iron uh, from the media. Whereas uh, iron replete conditions were made by ad adding iron chloride. So when we uh, grow these mutants uh, just in the presence of the minimal media, which is uh, low in iron, so we can see that these mutants, they were, have uh, less growth as compared to the uh, wild type. But this effect is more uh, evident um, in the presence of uh, uh, DP drill. Uh, so uh, these mutants, they are really struggling uh, to grow in comparison uh, uh, to the wild type. However, when the ferric chloride is added in the media, their growth is reinstated to the level of the uh, growth of the wild type and there is no uh, significant difference. Uh, so uh, the result of this assay shows that because of the deletion of this torn P gene, it impedes all the iron translocation across the bacterial cell, so which expected to result in the uh, reduced growth. The third in vitro characterization assay was carried out for the OBD mutants. Uh, so we have uh, used this uh, glutathione uh, that is naturally uh, produced by the bacteria in small quantities, but if they are uh, present in uh, high quantities, it could be toxic for the uh, bacterial cell. Uh, so, it, basically, the idea is that uh, in the OBD mutant, because they lack their functional transporter gene, uh, so they will be uh, more resistant to the toxic concentration of this glutathione in comparison uh, with the uh, wild type strain, which have their uh, functional OBD gene. So, they can uptake this uh, uh, glutathione and their growth will be inhibited. Uh, so you can see that um, for the OBD mutant, there is no significant uh, difference in the presence and absence of the glutathione. Uh, but um, for the wild type and for their complemented uh, mutants, uh, there is a difference in their uh, growth. So the last uh, in vitro characterization was carried out for arrow A mutant. So these mutants, they are basically exotrophic uh, for the aromatic amino acids. Uh, so in the absence of these amino acids, they, these mutants, they are really struggling to grow. Uh, but once these uh, uh, aromatic mixed media uh, was uh, supplemented in a minimal media, their growth is reinstated uh, to the level of the growth of their wild type. So this indicates that the deletion of the arrow A make this uh, mutant exotrophic for this aromatic amino acid. And once they were provided, uh, their growth is comparable to the wild type. So this is the summary of my first aim. Uh, we have uh, uh, shortlisted two apex strain for mutagenesis. We have uh, successfully made markerless mutant, and uh, uh, we have confirmed them uh, this mutagenesis using uh, uh, genomic testing and also some biochemical testing. Now, the next step is to test these mutants in the birds. But before that, we need an infection model for that. Uh, so the, my second aim of this PhD project is to the development of an infection model for reproduction of uh, avian cholibacillosis. But that model should also be compatible uh, for testing the genetically modified organisms. Uh, various models, they have been uh, uh, available in the literature using intratracheal, intra-air sac, intravenous that are able to reproduce this disease. Uh, and uh, but the problem is that these models they do not mimic the natural process of infection uh, because in in these models the bacteria were directly uh, landed to the their target site and they uh, bypasses all the mucosal uh, defense mechanism of the respiratory tract. But in contrast, the aerosol uh, uh, model is the one which is uh, uh, which mimics the natural route of infection and is considered as, as more physiologically relevant method. Uh, so we used the aerosol infection model that was described by genes at all. Uh, that was the uh, baseline of my study. Uh, and this model was able to reproduce uh, the disease, but it is not uh, compatible with the OGTR requirement for testing GMOs. Because in this model, we need to uh, transport the birds from their housing isolator to the aerosol infection chamber. So, uh, which poses a serious risk of uh, breaching uh, the containment of these infected organisms into the experimental facility. So, therefore, there is a need to uh, refine this method of infection. So, we evaluated two different exposure methods uh, for the uh, so that we can expose the bird within their housing isolator, and we don't need to remove them uh, or to take them uh, anywhere. 
so the first thing we tried is the use of automizer. So automizer is something similar to this. It's just like a spray. Uh, so we uh, opted for automizer because it is cost effective. It is suitable for research abilities because it does not require a lot of instrumentation. And most importantly, it was successfully used uh, to reproduce mycoplasma infection uh, in Turkey. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, it is it produce a coarse spray, and the droplet size they ranges between thirty to hundred microns. So the the tip of this um, automizer was kept at a, a distance of ten centimeter from the beak of the bird, and each bird it received ten sprays, um, and the uh, uh, the droplets they fall on the body surface of the uh, body of the bird and enter by uh, preening and inhalation. The second method we tested is the nebulizer method. So basically a nebulizer is something similar uh, to this and it, it is connected with the uh, source of uh, compressed air. So in this technique, we uh, divided the bird into two groups. Uh, and uh, they were placed inside this plastic container, and this plastic container was placed inside the their housing isolator. So, um, uh, but almost 10 ml of the bacterial culture was delivered over a period of uh, 10 minutes. So this is the experimental timeline for both of these experiments. Uh, for the optimizer method, we exposed the bird on three separate days, on day one, four, and seven. And uh, day 12 is our experimental endpoint. Um, for the nebulizer method, we also followed the same timeline. Uh, but after the second exposure, birth, they have started producing the clinical disease. Uh, so we have, uh, we have to terminate this experiment. So here is the results of the uh, two methods. We have uh, compared the ability of both uh, nebulizer and automizer to produce uh, disease in the respiratory tract. So let's uh, first have a look in what happened in the trachea. Uh, so in the trachea, there is no, not much uh, difference by the both methods. There are almost the same uh, number of birds from which um, uh, APEC was re-isolated. And also the average uh, uh, median uh, uh, number of APEC, they were also not significantly different. Uh, but interestingly, in the air sacs, there was no APEC re-isolated from the bird that were exposed using the uh, automizer method, but there are a number of birds from which APEC was uh, detected uh, using the uh, nebulizer method. Uh, so the result of this analysis shows that the nebulization method causes colonization of the APEC in the air sacs. The effect of this colonization was also uh, seen on, on the birds. They have, uh, uh, with the automizer method, there is no detectable clinical signs throughout the uh, duration of the experiment. But with the nebulizer met method, uh, just after the first exposure, uh, there are almost 35% of the birds and that are uh, showing clinical signs. So they were uh, either, uh, they were euthanized. And after the second exposure, the remaining birds, they also started producing the clinical signs. So they were also euthanized. Uh, so this uh, shows that nebulization method uh, successfully reproduced the uh, clinical disease. Now, if we, uh, look at the motility in the birds. It, there is only one group of bird uh, that showed motility. That was the one which were exposed uh, uh, to the aerosols of APEC E956 uh, using the nebulizer method. But in contrast, both uh, the groups, uh, um, the birds in the automizer exposed group, they continue to survive for all the 12 days. Uh, now, if we... Uh, um, see uh, the liens. Uh, we have also did the lien scoring at the time of the postmortem uh, with the same method, which I uh, told you earlier, that we scored them from zero to four, depending upon their severity. Uh, we can clearly see that the birds that were exposed using the uh, nebulizer method, they produce uh, uh, mild, moderate to severe liens in their air sacs. Uh, similarly, they also produce perihepatitis, and a lot of birds, they also showed uh, uh, pericarditis. While in comparison, uh, the automizer exposed bird, just on one or two birds, they showed mild liens. So this again shows that uh, nebulizer method successfully rep reproduced the uh, liens of avian colibacillosis. So from these results, it is clear that uh, nebulizer is the way to go. So in summary, uh, we have uh, 
effectively reproduce this disease using the nebulizer method. And uh, this method is also uh, compatible with the requirement of the OGTR uh, containment for testing GMOs. And now we are uh, good to go for our uh, in, in vivo experimental studies using these mutants. Uh, the results of this experiment are recently published in avian pathology. Uh, the animal ethics approval was really hard for this experiment because we are expecting some mortalities. Uh, so uh, we, we have to do some uh, very stringent monitoring. We have to monitor the bird even after two hours. So finally, when we uh, fulfill all the criteria of the animal ethics, so uh, I was awarded with this Animal Welfare Excellence Award. Now, the third aim of my PhD project is to evaluate the safety and uh, colonization ability of these mutants. Um, as I told you that we have uh, selected the apex that are uh, phylogenetically and serotypically diverse, so they can vary in their ability to cause the disease. So it is very important uh, for us to demonstrate the attenuation of their pathogenicity before we uh, test them for their uh, protective efficacy. Uh, so we uh, infected the uh, SPF chickens with the uh, with their mutant and their parental wild type, uh, so that we can select the best vaccine candidate. And uh, we uh, followed the same uh, timeline uh, as I told you in the last aim: uh, three uh, expo years on uh, three separate days, and day twelve is the experimental endpoint. So this is our uh, result of this experiment. Uh, if we look at the APEC one zero. 2026, uh, we can uh, see that uh, almost there is a same number of this number number of birds from which uh, the APEC DNA was detected. Uh, not not no significant difference, but yes, the average gene copy number of the mutant exposed groups it was significantly less than their wild type group, and uh, even the, the uh, average gene copy number of ROA mutant exposed uh, group is even less than the ton B of the double mutant exposed birds. Um, consistent with the finding of this uh, strain for the other strain, we have almost have the similar uh, findings. Uh, there is um, average the average gene copy number of the mutant exposed group is uh, less than the uh, parental strain. Okay, now. Uh, Interestingly, uh, if we see in the air sex, there is no DNA that was detected uh, from the birds that were exposed uh, to the mutants of APEC 102026. Uh, so this indicates their inability uh, to colonize the air sex. But in comparison, uh, the APEC DNA was detected uh, from the air sacs of the uh, birds that were exposed to the mutant of uh, APEC 10578. Uh, but however, the average copy number was significantly less there than the uh, parental strain. So uh, collectively, uh, the bacterial colonization data uh, from the trachea and the air sacs indicate the differential ability of wild type apex strain and their uh, derivative mutant uh, to colonize upper and uh, lower respiratory tract. Okay, now uh, we have also did some Leon scoring at the uh, time of postmortem, so we can uh, check the level of attenuation of these mutants. Uh, so for uh, the wild type exposed group, we can see that the birds, almost 60% of the birds, they showed Leon's that mild, moderate to severe, uh, while there is only few birds in the mutant exposed group uh, that uh, showed some Leon's. And very similar uh, results for the other strain. Uh, there is almost 60% of the bird that showed Leon's for the wild type uh, exposed group, but in comparison, a uh, few birds in the uh, mutant showed some wild Leon's. And interestingly, few, uh, some Leon's were also seen in the negative control group uh, without any uh, positive detection of APEC. So we can think maybe the reason of this air cyclitis can be linked to the use of the IBV vaccine, which we have used in the uh, start of uh, this experiment. So this is a summary of uh, AM3. We um, check the colonization rates, and we have found that the mutant of APEC 102026, they are only limited to trachea, uh, whereas the mutant for the 10578, they can colonize both trachea and air sacs. Uh, 
it is uh, expected that the this mutant because they can colonize the both lower and upper respiratory tract so they can induce an elevated mucosal immune response uh, but overall all these mutants they are safe in birds and they can be progressed towards the uh, vaccine efficacy studies so this is the overall conclusion of my project. Uh, in this uh, project, we try to overcome the uh, limitation of the existing vaccines against even polybacillosis. Uh, we have selected uh, two vaccine candidates that, that are distantly related from each other so that we can test them later for their homologous and heterologous uh, potential. Uh, we, for the first time, we uh, use this tripeptide glutathione assay uh, for the in vitro characterization of OBD mutant. Uh, we have developed an aerosol exposure model that is compatible uh, with the uh, testing of genetically modified organisms. And we have determined the safety and colonization ability of these mutants. So now our mutants, they are ready. And the next step definitely is to check their protection potential against their uh, both homologous and heterologous cha challenge. So if we, if these vaccines, they uh, were effective, they can be tested for other avian species. And we can also uh, check their longevity um, uh, of this vaccine induced protection uh, against the wild type challenge. And uh, we can also test these uh, mutants uh, in the presence of any uh, pre existing or uh, viral or bacterial infection. Uh, in this study, we also made a of this single mutant, although we haven't tested it. So uh, in the future, we can uh, test it in comparison with uh, its double mutant. And uh, we can also uh, test the mechanism of action of uh, these vaccines uh, and that uh, 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 different genomic and proteon proteonomic analysis can be uh, carried out uh, for these uh, cell surface receptors that for, uh, we are uh, uh, hypothesizing that they will be overexpressing on the uh, uh, surface of the bacteria. And also the determining the immune dominant receptors on the bacterial surface and find out some uh, vaccine induced cellular and humoral uh, responses. So there are a lot of things uh, that can be done in future. Uh, so at the last, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, uh, Mark, Amir and Kelly. Thanks a lot for all your help, support and guidance throughout this long journey of my PhD. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you so much for always motivating me. Whenever I come to you with some uh, frustrating results, your words that you will be okay, you are almost there, keeps me going. Amir, you are always very positive. You really helped me with my bird experiment. Thank you so much. Uh, Kelly, you are really amazing uh, in reading my uh, uh, thesis drafts. You really helped me in improving my writing skills. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie, uh, for serving as a uh, committee chair and keeping my uh, candidature on that track. All the members of EPCA team, I have learned a lot from you. Whenever I stuck somewhere, uh, you helped me with troubleshooting. Uh, all the present and past uh, postgraduate students, uh, uh, you are a big sport for me uh, whenever I need some uh, much needed distractions. So uh, you guys are there to help me out. Uh, my family, my parents who are always praying for me, who always believe in me, my sisters that are always a call away whenever I uh, need to discuss something or, or pass my frustration. Uh, and I will want to express the most profound appreciation to my husband. Uh, who was a big sport uh, throughout my PhD, especially the most challenging time of this COVID and after the birth of my daughter. Uh, he was always there to help me out. And, and the last but not the least, uh, my um, little one, Khatija, uh, who is always a source of joy for me and always behave like a, a cooperative baby. Uh, and at the end, I would like to uh, thank you, University of Melbourne, for providing me this uh, international research scholarship uh, so that I can uh, complete my studies. Uh, so at the end, I would like to thank you all uh, for your patient listening. And uh, that's all from my side. If you have any question, please uh, unmute yourself and ask. Excellent, Neil. And you, you did. You did the, the only thing I had to do was to ask people if they wanted to ask any question, but you did already, so that's fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And we can we can all uh, 
uh, use our, our virtual reactions to, uh, to uh, give a good round of applause uh, to Winnie. And now, uh, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to ask them directly, just unmute yourself and, uh, and we also have we also have some questions. If you want, I can monitor on the chat. So if you want to ask your question on the chat, uh, that's also possible. So Glenn has a question. Thanks, and that was great. Um, I was just wondering, um, I think when I was looking at your picture of the, um, the chromogenic agar, yep. it looked like the, the double mutant, the Opti Ton B mutant had a smaller zone uh, let me go. Around, is that right? Uh, this one is the single mutant, and this one is the double mutant. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so I'm... almost the same sizes. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the one, oh, the one at the top is an opti. They are the complement mutants. Yes. Okay. Now, in that case, my question is irrelevant. I was wondering what was going on. So uh, okay. that's all right. Thanks. Welcome. All right. Any any other question? Just having a look at the chat, if there are any questions or so. Um, any, any other comments? Uh, one thing that, that um, really um, amazed me, Uni, but I've never been able to find a, a convincing explanation is when you have a ton B mutant. Yes. You can clearly see that it's impaired in ion uptake because it's producing more side O4 and it's not growing as well. All these trends are, are really yeah. struggling to grow. Yep. Uh, and, but when you add, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, ferric um, um, chloride, which is Fe3, but it's, it's, um, it's an oxidized form of, of iron. Yes. Um, the, the, immediately the, the strains, even the mutants tend to grow much better. Yes. But, but uh, side arrow for transporters transport ferric ion, not ferrous ion, yes. which, which tends to be absent from your medium because iron tends to be automatically uh, oxidized. So how do you explain the, the effect of uh, ferric ion adding added to the medium? I think, Mark, uh, the import of this ferric iron is from the torn B independent sources. Uh, so it's not depending upon the ton B for this uptake. So there are some other uh, uh, systems in the bacteria like F4B, FVOB, I'm not clearly sure, but it, there are definitely some other uh, receptors in the bacteria that can uh, uptake iron uh, without the need of ton B gene. So maybe that's why in the pericloride, uh, their growth is reinstated uh, to the growth of uh, the level of their parental wild types. So definitely they're taking it from some other source, not torn B yeah, dependent source. The, mm. the, there must be a bypass. I was just yeah. wondering if there is still a little bit of ion import, even in the absence of torn B uh, and Fe3 plus ion managing to, to go, to get inside uh, the cell because, and adding a lot of ferric ion probably compensate or probably does something there, but I've never been able to find a good, a good, mm -hmm. uh, a good explanation. So. <laughs> That's as good as we get, as good as it gets. Any other question? I'm just checking. All right, it looks like you convince everyone. Uh, about, or uh, maybe confuse everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but impossible. So I think that we can all, all uh, thank you again for, uh, for your contribution and for this, what has been a very long journey. We're almost at the end. And uh, and thank you for proving that the, the main the main job of a of a supervisor is simply to say yeah that's okay you will you will get there and <laughs> and that's it and that's all you need for but it for means a lot system. Mark when when you are really frustrated it means a lot yeah that you were all right. at least your supervisor is satisfied <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. okay thanks very much Unib and we will just have a bit of a chat a bit later if you want okay thank you so much thanks. everyone.